Welcome to the SARS Tax Practitioner Readiness Program, Module 2 of 8. Criteria for the recognition of controlling bodies. What are the learning objectives for this module? Well, at the end of this module, you are expected to understand the criteria for the recognition of a controlling body in four specific areas namely the minimum qualifications and experience requirements, the continuing professional education requirements, the codes of ethics and conduct, and the disciplinary process and procedures for these controlling bodies. We would also expect of you to understand the impact of not adhering to the code of conduct of your controlling body. If you remember in module one, we shared with you the, this diagram. And what this diagram showed was that there are really three sources that regulates the conduct of a registered tax practitioner. And during module one, we looked at the Tax Administration Act specifically. For this session, however, we want to focus on the criteria document for the recognition of controlling bodies. So, for a controlling body to be recognized by the Commissioner of SARS as a recognized controlling body, it must meet the following criteria. And that is, it must be approved in terms of Section B of the Income Tax Act for the purpose of Section 10.1D4. Then it must also have a minimum of a thousand members when applying for recognition, or there must be a reasonable prospect of attaining 1,000 members within a year of applying. The body must ensure with regards to natural persons that the following are maintained. Now, these are two very important words that I would like to place some emphasis on. So it says that the controlling body must ensure that it maintains relevant and effective. Emphasis on these two words, it must be relevant and it must be effective. It's not just good enough to have, for example, a minimum qualification and experience requirements. It's not just enough to have a continuing professional education requirement or to have a code of ethics and conduct or to have a disciplinary process. All of these four requirements must be relevant and it must be effective in regulating the behavior of a member, or in this case, a registered tax practitioner. So what are the recognition criteria, the minimum qualifications? Well, for, this, for the registration of a tax practitioner on or after the 1st of June, 2022, the following requirements apply. So you must have an NQF level six, and above with at least one accounting module and one tax module. In addition to having an NQA6, you must have at least one year's tax working experience. Now again, it must be, you must have, you must have, apologies, you must have one year's relevant tax working experience. So working at a company that does tax, but you are the cleaner, for example, does not qualify you for a one year experience. It must be experience in a tax environment doing the work linked to tax. You could have an NQF level five, but then you must have four years tax working experience or NQF level four, where you should then have 10 years tax working experience. Please note that the tax working experience must be verifiable by employers or your clients. Now, it, it's important that each controlling body might have its own manner in which it will test or verify your working experience, and you need to take that into consideration. But these are, broadly speaking, the requirements that we place on controlling bodies um, for members wanting to be recognized, registered tax practitioners. In addition to meeting the minimum qualifications, prospective tax practitioners should also have completed this very readiness program 
that you are taking part in at the moment. So it must be the successful completion of the readiness program and that you have successfully passed the assessment. What about continuous professional education, also known as CPE? Well, there the requirements are that each year you must have 18 verifiable CPE hours per year. The CPE hours, however, is broken down into 10 that is tax related hours, two ethical related hours, and six relating to the service that you provide. Please note that the CPE records of individual tax practitioners, you must retain it for a period of five years so that your controlling body can verify that you have actually conducted the continuous professional education. What about the minimum regulatory codes? Well, there are different regulatory codes. Um, this, and, and each and they have different themes. So that you could get the code of ethics and conduct, and we will discuss four areas: honesty and integrity, professional competence, confidentiality and fees, and then disciplinary code and procedures. <clears throat> what about professional competence? Tax practitioners must maintain, attain, and maintain knowledge and skills relevant to the service provided to clients. It's not going to help if you are rendering a bad service to your clients, but you know nothing about that. Or if you are, or if you are in, um, re rendering a service related to PAYE, but you know nothing about PAYE. Please ensure that you have the professional competence to be able to do the job and that the service that you are rendering is not driven by the, the obtaining of a, um, higher fees or increasing the profitability of your business. So as practitioners, you need to take reasonable care in ascertaining a client's state of affairs to the extent that those affairs are relevant to a statement being made on behalf of the client. And what does that mean? What it basically means is that if a taxpayer comes to you and is driving a Porsche 911 Turbo S, and he's telling you that he is earning absolutely zero income, you need to do, you need to undertake a, a reasonable care assessment. You need to go and see, but hold on, how is this individual earning his income in order to be able to drive a car such as the Porsche? Now, this is purely just an example. They could be driving any other vehicle. Please don't hold me to the statement. But the point being that you need to ascertain a certain baseline for your client, understand certain basic information. You also need to ensure that the tax taxation laws are applied correctly and that they are applied lawfully to the circumstances of the particular client. So it's pointless, for example, um, saying that if an individual, for example, worked from home during COVID and you're saying, well, you worked at home for two days out of the two years, therefore we're going to apply for you for a um, home office. You're not applying the legislation correctly, while at the same time, the individual might just have been working from the bedroom again. That's not applying the law correctly. You should also not knowingly obstruct the improper administration of the tax laws. So to make a simple example, um, don't give us the runaround. Don't um, object when no objections are, are reasonable. Don't appeal when you know your appeal is not reasonable. Um, purely to buy your client some time. That is obstructing the proper administration of the tax laws. Again, these are just some examples, but there could be others. Professional competence also speaks to ensuring that you advise your clients of their rights and obligations under the laws of the country. Very important. You also need to exercise due diligence and care in the interaction with staff on behalf of their clients. So yes, you might be a bit frustrated by the various um, processes that SARS has put in place, 
Um, it might irritate you to some extent, but it still does not give you the right to abuse our staff verbally or physically. In these kind of instances where all of this is found, we could report you to your controlling body for being unprofessional. And we have had instances like this. Examples of when a tax practitioner might be in breach of this code. Well, um, withholding a client's e-filing profile due to fees, it's not very professional. You obviously need to um, follow a different process in order to collect the outstanding fees. Where you are not advising a client regarding the correct date of liability and registration for a tax type, for example, for VAT. Let's say your client exceeds you, you might be doing the income tax, but you notice that the client is exceeding the, the VAT threshold. Are you advising him of the need to register for VAT? Or you may be even assisting him to register for VAT. If you are, are you then ensuring that the correct date of liability is being applied? For example, if he exceeded the million rand threshold six months ago, are you only registering him now for VAT and making the date of liability as of today? That is not being professional and it is not being competent. What about the providing of questionable advice, which doesn't match the facts of the matter? For example, an employee that reached a retirement age, uh, but the employer still requires the services of that employee. You then give advice to the client that the employee should open up a company and that the employer can continue paying a salary to the employee through the company. The employee, however, is not issuing um, any invoices and unfortunately doesn't meet the definition of an independent contractor. Now that advice is neither professional, neither is it competent. What about the area of honesty and integrity? Well, tax practitioners should be straightforward and honest in all their business relationships. Integrity also implies dealing fairly and truthfully. So what does this mean? Well, tax practitioners themselves must be compliant in terms of the taxation laws in, in, in the conduct of the personal affairs. Now, some of the controlling bodies might require of you pro to provide them with a tax compliance status report. But it's important that as a tax practitioner, you need to understand that if you are not tax compliant, you do run the risk of being deregistered as a tax practitioner. And even if you have rectified that non-compliance, you are still out. You can you you can only re sort of re-register or reapply after a period of six months. Tax practitioners must also not knowingly be associated with reports, returns, communications, or any other form of information where the practitioner believes that the information contains a materially false or misleading statement, or that it contains statements furnished recklessly, or omits or obscures information that is required to be included where that omission or obscurity would be misleading. You will notice that a lot of this wording is very broad, materially false, misleading statement, furnished recklessly, um, obscure information. There aren't definitions for any of these terms. So please be very, very careful when you provide any kind of advice to your clients. Make sure that you ask these kind of questions before you give them the advice. When you do become aware of the kind of information that your client might be giving you, um, you should not you should cease to represent the taxpayer concerned if this client does not want to remedy the situation remember the minute you represent him your name is attached to the advice that is being given and the question you need to ask is it worth the risk to provide this kind of assistance to this taxpayer because you have quite a bit to lose Yes, all of the advice should be done given in, long, in line with 
the Tax Administration Act because there are very specific chargeable offences under that act, as we spoke about in module one. So let's look at some examples of when a practitioner might be in breach of the Honesty and Integrity Code. Well, as we mentioned, the tax practitioner that owes SARS outstanding debt or outstanding returns, he is in breach of this code, especially if he fails to, re to remedy the non-compliance. Also, if you under-declare, for example, if you are um, submitting no returns for clients, even though you know that they are conducting trade, that's a form of under-declaration. Or, or if you are either reducing the income that needs to be declared or inflating the expenses that needs to be declared. What about deliberately submitting returns late or making payments late without arrangements or suspension of payments being in place. All of that shows that there's a problem with your ethics and with your conduct. Or impersonating clients when engaging with SARS. Now this might sound ridiculous, but we've had uh, tax practitioners that have phoned into our contact center, for example, and they have in actual fact tried to impersonate a client. Now, that is not honest. It, it puts into question your honesty and your integrity as a tax practitioner. What about signing a power of attorney on behalf of your client, especially if they are not around? That is also not honest. So please refrain from conducting yourselves in this unethical manner. It could get you reported and it could get you removed as a tax practitioner. What about confidentiality and fees? Well, tax practitioners must maintain the confidentiality of their clients and should not disclose client information to any third party without the client's permission. Information disclosed by the client should not be used by the practitioner for personal gain or advantage. So basically, you cannot go and steal your client's idea, your business ideas, or share that kind of information with others in terms of how profitable the business is. What about the charging of fees? Well, fees charged must be undertaken on behalf of a client, has to be commensurate with the nature and complexity of the task at hand. What does this mean? Basically, in essence, it means you must have been, you must have determined the complexity of the work needed, and then you must base a fee relative to that complexity. You cannot charge a client 5,000 rand for submitting a return when it actually took you five minutes to com five minutes or less to complete. That's not really ethical, isn't it? Unless there is a degree of complexity. Now, the charging of a contingency fee is also considered a no-no, especially when it comes to the completion of tax returns. Now, most many instances we've noticed that certain practitioners charge the members a percentage fee of the refund. Now, by charging a, a percentage fee, that places a bit of an if places the practitioner in a bit of an unethical dilemma or ethical dilemma, because the higher the refund, the bigger your fee. The question then becomes: Are you going to unnecessarily try to influence the value of the refund so that you can get a higher fee? From a SaaS perspective, the charging of a contingency fee based on a percentage refund or a percentage basis is not an acceptable form of remuneration. What about criminal status verification? For tax practitioners registered on or after the 1st of June of 2022, an independently verified criminal free certificate um, in terms of Section 243 of the Act must be produced, produced and provided to a recognized controlling body at the point of registration. Thereafter, an annual confirmation is required that your status remained the same. Following this, a sworn affidavit indicating that you are criminal free in terms of Section 243 of the Act must be produced and provided to a controlling body once every five years. 
basically what we are saying here, ladies and gentlemen, is that you must not be in possession of a criminal offence or a criminal record, especially in the areas that we mentioned in earlier when we looked at module one. Don't go down this rabbit hole. For those registered prior to 1 June 2022, well, the status quo remains and its sworn affidavit is required to be produced once every five years. Disciplinary code and procedures. Yes, a controlling body must maintain disciplinary codes and procedures. So when a complaint is lodged to a controlling body by SARS or clients in general, the controlling body must um, review those complaints and decide what action is appropriate. The disciplinary code must also address the complaints that may be lodged in terms of Section 241 of the Tax Administration Act. Disciplinary processes and procedures have to be in place and the sanctions must fit the offence committed. Or in other words, the penalty must fit the crime. If somebody commits murder, for example, um, it would be inappropriate for the court to give a one year jail term. Yes, the offence does not fit the crime. So the sanction similarly must fit the offence that is committed. And there should be a range of sanctions that can address the severity and the effect of the non-compliant behavior of a, of a member. Now, this could include warnings, um, recommendations for a tax practitioner to undertake educational courses to increase competency. It could be financial sanctions, or it could even be the removing them as a member completely. The sanction should effectively change the behavior of the tax practitioner and repeated non-compliant behavior must receive a harsher sanction than was imposed previously. When there is disciplinary action taken, the outcome of those hearings, um, especially where they have been found guilty, must be reported to SARS as well as the client that lodged the complaint. And when the disciplinary hearing results in the removal of a member, the identity and the sanctioning of the member must be published on the controlling body's website. The controlling body must retain jurisdiction over its members, um, notwithstanding that they may have resigned, provided that the conduct and the investigation took place at the time they were a member of the controlling body. And basically what it means is that if I am a member of an RCB as of today and I did something wrong, if, I, if there is a complaint laid against me and I decide to resign from this controlling body, let's say on Friday, but it hasn't followed the disciplinary process, if, that, if a complaint is lodged against me on Monday, even though I am no longer a member of the controlling body, seeing that I resigned as a member on Friday, that controlling body is obliged to still continue the investigation because the offence occurred when I was a member of that controlling body. And this is really to prevent um, tax practitioners from hopping from one controlling body to another without these um, complaints being finalized. The controlling body should also require the members to declare that they have not been removed from a controlling body for misconduct and that they do not have a criminal record. A practitioner that is removed by a recognized controlling body for serious misconduct cannot and should not be accepted as a member of another recognized controlling body. This brings to end, ladies and gentlemen, module two. We hope that by going through the criteria document and explaining what some of the, these terms mean and looking at some of the practical implications and scenarios, we hope that it will educate you in understanding the huge responsibility that you have as a tax practitioner. We will now move on to module number three.